Actually, next up is uh, Lauren Collins. Uh, he's an author. Uh, the first time I heard of him, he's a publisher, sent me one of his books about skeptical topics. Um, last year, I, he actually talked about his book, basically. It was a different take on it. But this year, I'm not going to try to say a couple of those words because I have brain damage. But it's going to be about Bible poppycock, I guess. That's what that means, right? <laughs> I, you can tell yeah, he's a lawyer, which, but don't hate him for that. Some lawyers are good, especially if they're skeptical lawyers. We need some. Um, so, Lauren, you can come up here. The, he's also the joker, so I'm not sure you should trust anything he's about to say. I didn't do that. I didn't have men men Mexican for lunch, so that wasn't me. Ta-da. That, that was the comedy of the uh, night for me. <laughs> Lauren Collins. The nice thing about the Riddler costume is that I can come cosplay, and when I sit behind this desk, I just look professional. <laughs> um, uh, yes, as, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, by the way, uh, this is a panel here. Uh, it's pronounced Biblical, Apocrypha, and Pseudepigrapha. Um, uh, part of the panel's on that. I mainly just wanted to include that word in the title because I love it so much. <laughs> um, yes, um, as was announced earlier, too, uh, if you were here for the uh, more about James Randi panel, uh, I am clearly not James Randi, um, but uh, Put on a beard. yes, if, if, if you wanted to learn more about James Randi, um, here's the time I, he met me, so uh, <laughs> that's all I have to offer on that. Um, beyond that, uh, yes, I am a lawyer uh, locally. Uh, I, I grew up in Stone Mountain. I live in Atlanta now. Uh, also recently started my own mediation practice. Um, and uh, because mediation, unlike law firms, don't have to have my name in the title, um, my mediation practice is named, and this is registered with the Georgia Secretary of State, Wolfram and Hart. <laughs> I am the CEO of Wolfram and Hart. Um, I also, just for fun, uh, ran for office uh, a couple months ago in a special election uh, up in the Brookhaven area. There are more people in this room than voted for me in that election. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, thank you, too, for not having a major exodus towards the door when you were told Randy was not going to be here. Yes, also, as Derek mentioned, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Bull Spotting: Finding Facts in the Age of Misinformation. Um, you can find the old Skepticality episode where Derek interviewed me. It's just a general sort of guidebook. Uh, to skeptical thought and whatnot. Um, you can see my birtherism talk here from last year that's up on the Skeptrack website. Uh, I gave a talk two years ago on pseudo-law. Um, but uh, today I'm here to talk about uh, non-canonical books of the Bible, the books that are not uh, among the 66 books that are in the uh, Protestant canon. Um, my introduction to the idea of books that weren't in the Bible that you know my parents had in the house... Sorry, my bad. That's fine. Uh, my introduction growing up was uh, my family had a set of childcraft books in the house. Um, and uh, they covered a variety of, you know, actual scientific and uh, literary subjects and whatnot. And uh, one of my favorite books, however, uh, being young and impressionable, was a book called, it was an annual called Mysteries and Fantasies. And it had all kinds of articles in there about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and man-eating plants in South America and stuff. And, uh, and one of them was a story about uh, D the prophet Daniel uh, meeting and killing a dragon. Um, and it was from these extra chapters from the book of Daniel that were included in the Catholic Apocrypha. Uh, and the reason it was in this childcraft book was it talked about um, uh, an excavation that had been done in the Middle East, which had found, uh, I forget specifically uh, where it was, um, uh, it was, you know, ancient Babylon. Um, and it had like three real animals, like a lion and uh, uh, a, a couple of others. And then it had this carved on the wall. Uh, and so alongside three real animals, there's this thing. Um, and it was speculated uh, that this is supposed to be the Surush, um, a mythical creature that was worshipped at the time, dating to the 6th century BC. It's a, a, a dragon. Uh, you see parts of an eagle, a cat, uh, a snake, and all kinds of stuff there. Um, and this comes from the chapters of Daniel that are in the Apocrypha, um, which are part of the Catholic 
Bible to some extent, is, is, is Deutero canon books. I'll talk about that later. Um, and, uh, and in the story, the Babylonians worship this dragon, uh, a living thing uh, there, and uh, Daniel makes up something with some pitch and stuff, stuffs it in the thing's mouth, and it dies. Um, and uh, so I, I think the Childcraft book was entertaining the notion of, was this thing real? Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the notion that these were books I wasn't aware of uh, it intrigued me. Uh, my family did, in fact, have a, a big old Catholic uh, Bible. It's uh, this. It's this gigantic thing that sits um, in, in the living room. I took this the other day. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's an ornamental piece of some kind. Um, but it has those extra chapters in there. But uh, I ended up uh, not learning more about this subject or what else there was uh, about it until I went to college. Uh, you know, given that uh, Derek and either myself mentioned earlier about my, any of my religious credentials, that's because they pretty much go to, I have an undergraduate degree in religion. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm not the, the, as the level of expert that some other people here maybe this weekend, but I've, uh, I, I, I wanted to, to give as scholarly a talk here as I could and keep it entertaining. Um, uh, this is, incidentally, probably, I'm willing to bet, the first skep track talk, if not the first Dragon Con talk period, that uh, originated as a rejected Sunday school pitch. <laughs> uh, so I was told it wouldn't be interesting, and I hope to prove Brian wrong about that. Um, anyhow, so uh, because I assume the crowd here is going to have uh, you know, somewhat of a different background than, say, a Sunday school might, uh, some, some of the background here. Um, in, in the early days, uh, in, in the first and second century, um, before the Christian church had really settled on sort of a single theology, there were a bunch of different competing sects. Um, uh, and, for example, you might have heard of the Gnostics. Um, the Gnostics were a group that, and I don't want to spend too much time on theology here, obviously, because that's not the main point. Um, the, the, the Gnostics were, were very mystical. They believed that God was unknowable. They had this very complex creation myth that involved all kinds of levels of gods creating each other, and it, it's, I'll talk about some, that later on. Um, and they believed that, for the most part, there was some difference among them, that Jesus was a real guy, but he wasn't holy. And then when he was baptized, that the Christ, who is different from Jesus, entered Jesus and turned him from a, just a normal human guy who God liked a lot into God, you know, sort of po possessed him. Um, so that's, that was one approach in those early couple of centuries to who Jesus was and what the church, you know, thought he represented in terms of his relationship to God. Uh, you also had a group uh, now called the Ebionites. Um, and these are just examples. I'm going to pick Four examples here. Um, the Ebionites were very Jewish. They, they believed in retaining everything about Judaism, um, you know, re respecting the Sabbath, all, all the old Orthodox laws, all of it. They believed that Jesus wasn't really God at all, that he was just sort of a new prophet, you know, that God liked him a lot, um, but that he, he wasn't, you know, a, an incarnate incarnation of God on earth. Uh, another group you had was the Marcionites. They were named after a fella named Marcion of Sinope, who was uh, an early Christian leader, uh, born around, I think, like 85 AD. Um, and uh, he, he was very influential in his day. Uh, his proposal as to who Jesus was, was that Jesus, in fact, was not a person at all, that he was basically sort of a phantom or like a hard light hologram type of thing. Um, that God wasn't capable of entering the world as we know it, that he was just sort of a image of a man walking around interacting with the world. Uh, and Marcion, in fact, also argued that the, if you've ever heard the argument that uh, the Old Testament God is vengeful and wrathful and the New Testament God is uh, forgiving and loving, uh, Marcion solved this problem by suggesting there are two different gods um, and that the Old Testament God was sort of a middleman um, who had, you know, the, the, the New Testament God was sort of a superior guy. He had created this, the, the Jewish God, uh, who he referred to as the, I think, the Demiurge, um, who created the world but wasn't a great guy. And then finally, the New Testament God stepped in to say, no, here is Jesus to, we're going to do away with everything about Judaism. Um, 
And then you have, by the way, uh, a lot of this talk owes a lot to the work of Bart Ehrman, who's a religious scholar. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be referring to his books here later. One of them particularly is a book called Lost Scriptures, books that did not make it into the New Testament. Uh, have some fun quoting from that later. Um, uh, Ehrman refers to a group called the Proto-Orthodox, which uh, obviously that's what, not what they were called then. Uh, these were the people who eventually became what we sort of, ex you know, became the mainstream uh, Christian thought. The, the, the notion that Jesus was the son of God and that he actually was God incarnate. Uh, not some sort of lesser God, but equal and all that kind of thing. Um, it, it's what's represented uh, and embodied in the Nicene Creed that the Council of Nicaea adopted in 325, which was that um, uh, he, he was very God, a very God, uh, uh, begotten, not made, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the reason that the Nicene Creed was written at that council was to sort of solidify and, you know, we have all these different sex disagreements. We're going to write down this is what we agree on. This is, this is what represents Christianity going forward. Um, so th that's just to illustrate some of the different ideas that were floating around in those early years before you had a New Testament. Because obviously in the early years before you had a New Testament, you just had different books floating around, different local organizations, different, uh, the, the Gnostics had different books than the Ebionites. Um, uh, the Ebionites, for example, had a book of Matthew that didn't have the birth story because they didn't think he was, you know, the son of God, so they didn't care about his birth. Um, and things like that. So, eventually, when we do get uh, to having some kind of selection process for what books are going to be part of the Christian canon going forward, you obviously have your canon books. Um, for the Old Testament, a lot just came from adopting the Jewish Old Testament. There's 39 books there. Uh, what was selected over time were 27 New Testament books. Um, so those are what I'm referring to when I refer to canon. You also have books that are referred to as the uh, deuterocanon, uh, and that is what you sort of traditionally is referred to as uh, the Apocrypha, the, the Old Testament. The, the, the Catholics represent, uh, recognize these handful of Old Testament books as deuterocanon, in that they're, they're not really inspired by God, they're not really scripture, but they believe it's okay to read them in church, they believe that you can sort of learn valuable moral lessons from them, uh, but, but they aren't holy scripture in the same way that the canon books are. Um, you have your, uh, I did not learn how to pronounce this word, um, Anta, Antil, Antiligomena, I forgot. Wikipedia did not have a pronunciation for this. Um, but this is, this is just a broad sweeping term for any text whose authenticity or value is disputed. Um, and some of those books made it into the New Testament. Some of those books didn't. Um, but it, it's, it's just a, a, an umbrella term for books that uh, theologians of the time weren't sure about. Um, and then you have pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha specifically refers to books that were written in the name of someone, but that person didn't actually write them. Um, it's sort of the opposite of ghostwritten. Um, so when you have something like, say, uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene did not write that. Someone who wrote it down pretended that they were her for various reasons, but she was not it. Therefore, that makes it part of the pseudepigrapha. Um, a, a book that claims to be written by Adam, of Adam and Eve fame, uh, pseudepigrapha. So, uh, and to cover a little bit about how we got the, those 66 books, there we go. Uh, as far as the Old Testament goes, I, I won't be, unfortunately, covering an awful lot of the Old Testament. Once I had this outlined, I realized I don't have time. Um, but, uh, did I put a picture in there? I thought I did. Um, yes, uh, the Old Testament was, there's actually not an awful lot known uh, about the process that went into settling on the Old Testament. It all happened at least third century BC. They didn't exactly keep a lot of records of it. Um, but by the time you get to the Septuagint, if you've ever heard of that, it was when they translated the, uh, the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Uh, that pretty much laid down the parts. You had the, the five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 
those didn't change. Those were there for the longest time. Um, uh, you had a number of prophets, major and minor, uh, and then you had a selection of books, I think called the Ketuvim, which uh, referred to uh, sort of your writings, your, your Psalms, your Proverbs, uh, and then some of your histories like Esther and, and whatnot. Uh, as for the New Testament, now the, the, the New Testament, we have lots more records about, uh, and there was, there was dispute about it. Um, Marcion, who I mentioned earlier, uh, was one of the, was as thing as far as we know, the first person to actually, that we have record of, who created a list of books saying these are the books that I think belong in the Christian canon. You know, there's a bunch of them floating around, some of them we don't want to recognize, these are the ones we should trust. Um, this was about 140 AD, so it, you know, it's fairly early. Uh, what he included was he had a version of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, not the other three Gospels, um, and he had ten of the uh, letters by Paul. Uh, the current uh, Gospel, I think, has thirteen. Um, so that's what he included. That was it. One Gospel, thirteen letters, no revelation, nothing else. Uh, Marcion, however, was condemned as heretical uh, in 144 AD. Um, so he had the first one, not the, the more mainstream folks in the church, or the ones who became mainstream, didn't like him, uh, even though they didn't actually quibble with his selection there all that much. Um, uh, he, he had a, a lot of common in, with the Gnostics, uh, and, and they, they lost that war. Um, the Muratonian canon, which is named for, I think, the fellow who discovered it, um, was discovered in Milan in the early 18th century, has 22 books. Uh, it's from later in the second century. Um, and uh, I forget what's missing. I think it's missing a couple of the letters. Uh, it might still be missing. Um, oh, it actually says up there. Um, that's where my notes differ from the screen. Uh, yeah, it does not include Hebrews, uh, James, a couple of the other letters. It does include the Wisdom of Solomon uh, and the Apocalypse of Peter. It mentions a book called The Shepherd of Hermas, which was another apocalyptic book. Um, and it does specifically talk about forgeries, um, and it, it rejects them, and it, and it condemns them as being improper, and why the church should not recognize them. Um, slightly more interesting, in 311 AD, uh, there's a, a Roman uh, a historian who was a, the father of church history, as he's known at Eusebius. And he not only created a list, he categorized the books. He talked about not just the books who were in the canon, but the books that were questionable and the books that were out. Um, he talked about uh, acknowledged, those were the good ones, disputed, which were the ones, uh, there's some question about them, uh, spurious, which was the books where the authorship w was sort of in doubt. Uh, he, you know, can't be certain that they, they were written by the people who claimed, you know, in the you know, title page, claimed to have written them or the one that the church believed had written them, uh, and then just the ones he rejected outright. Um, on the acknowledged list, you have the four Gospels. Th those fairly early were considered, you know, fairly solid across the board uh, among the theologians of the time. Um, you had the Pauline epistles, you had 1 John, 1 Peter, um, and what he... he he wrote Revelation, but then he said, he sort of uh, cautioned that, because then he put it in another list, too, uh, because he was willing to say some people accepted this, some people didn't. Uh, on his disputed list, as books he wasn't sure should belong in the canon or not, he listed James, Jude, Second Peter, and Second and Third John. Um, and in centuries since, those continued to be disputed to some extent by various people. Uh, on his list of spurious ones, uh, where you know they, they claimed an author, these were more or less your pseudepigraphal books. These are uh, Acts of Paul, Shepherd of Hermas, Apocalypse of Peter, uh, and he included. This is where he also included Revelation, uh, because he wasn't sure it was written by the Apostle John, uh, because the church early on, you know, started to consider that the Apostle John had written this, even though the book just says it was written by John. Doesn't, nowhere in the book does he claim to be an apostle. He just says, I'm John, and John was a common name. Um, uh, similar for the book of Hebrews. Uh, the Hebrews, to a large extent, made it in the Bible because people considered that it had been written by Paul, even though it doesn't claim to have been written by Paul. And the scholarly consensus nowadays is that it wasn't. Um, 
on your rejected list, you have your Gospel of Peter, Thomas, Matthias, uh, Acts of Andrew, Acts of John, so on like this. Uh, and Eusebius wrote, no one ever thought it worthwhile to mention any of these in any of his treatises. So people didn't even write about them uh, as seriously. Uh, and shortly, about 50 years thereafter, you had the canon of Athanasius. Uh, this is the earliest surviving list of exactly the 27 books that are in our current New Testament, uh, Matthew through Revelation. Um, but that was, uh, Athanasius was just a guy writing the canon of the third synod of, did I have four? Yeah, there we are. Canon of the Third Synod of Carthage uh, in 393. This was the first official where, where they had sort of a meeting of church leaders and they, they agreed on these 27 books. Um, the Catholic Church uh, formally, I mean, this, this just sort of became the New Testament. Adapted. The Catholic Church did not formally, officially, like, write down and say, this is the 27 books that we agree on, I think, until the 1500s um, because... They didn't really have a lot of internal disagreement over this. Uh, that came up eventually because of Martin Luther, uh, to some extent. Um, uh, Ehrman, uh, in, in one of his books, writes that the standards for inclusion that the, a lot of these leaders tended to look at when they were trying to figure out what books to include, what books to exclude. They had a somewhat proto-skeptical approach to this, even if they didn't necessarily exercise it quite as you know, uh, we might today. Um, one of the things they looked for is whether the books were actually ancient. Because, you know, even writing from the, you know, 300s, they are still wanting to look for books that, as far as they know, are actually 250 years old. Um, in, the, in the events that they knew these books had only been written in the last 50 or 100 years, they just rejected them themselves. Because they, they know these aren't old enough, they clearly weren't written by the people whose names are on the cover. Uh, so, no, that's out. Um, this is why uh, the Shepherd of Hermas was kicked out. Um, second category was apostolic. Uh, with a whole bunch of books floating around, they decided that one of the, the only way they could be certain, from a theological standpoint, that these books actually represented the teachings of Jesus is if they came from someone who was close to him or to one of the apostles. So uh, your books of Matthew and John, your gospels of Matthew and John make it in because, again, even though neither book claims to be written by an apostle, it was just sort of believed that they were written by apostles. Therefore, that's fine. They were written by apostles. That's good enough. Uh, Mark and Luke were believed to be written by people who were close to the apostles, Luke uh, being a traveling companion of Paul. So they make the cut because, again, close enough to the apostles that it's believed that they're accurately representing what Jesus had to say. Um, the books also had to be Catholic in, in the old terminology, which basically meant that they were sort of widespread, that, you know, in, in, in all these tiny little church communities all around the uh, Mediterranean, the Middle East, that uh, all, they were widely accepted. Uh, this is where books like Second Peter and whatnot ran into trouble because not everyone used them. Uh, and finally, that they were orthodox, uh, that when they were developing these canon lists in the 300s, was the theology that these books represented uh, basically not Gnostic? Was it not Marcionite? Was, was, was this the theology that they should, thought should be represented in the church's canon? Um, and, and this had a tendency to be an easy way to sort of reverse engineer uh, what books made it in. Uh, for example, if a book, you know, if you had a book in front of you that claims to be written by, let's say, Timothy, uh, who's an apostle, uh, you know, maybe it's ancient, it says that it's written by Timothy, maybe it's popular, uh, but it, it promotes some pretty big heresies. Well, if it does that, clearly Timothy couldn't have written it because he's an apostle. Therefore, it wasn't written by Timothy. Therefore, it's, you know, then it's out. Um, so, so this resulted in a number of disputed books in the early years. So various books that were disputed but made it into the New Testament, uh, Hebrews. People weren't sure if Paul had written it, but it, you know, made the cut eventually. Uh, most of your letters that were not written by Paul. 
uh, which includes First and Second Peter, First and Second and Third John, Jude, uh, and and so on. Uh, and Revelation was uh, contentious uh, for a long time, uh, disputed, but not included. Uh, there's a book called First Clement that I'll talk about later uh, that a lot of early churches used. It eventually did not make the cut. Uh, the Apocalypse. Apocalypse of Peter was really popular for a long time. It didn't make the cut either. Uh, and obviously all of your books of the Apocrypha didn't make the cut. Uh, I mentioned Martin Luther earlier. Uh, Martin Luther, again, 1500s, uh, made it very clear when he was talking theology, when he was promoting what he thought should be in the, the Christian canon, he himself did not include Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. He, he didn't entirely think those books were trustworthy. And he thought it was, you know, to err on the side of caution, those books should be left out. Um, where do we get our information about the books that didn't make the Bible then? Um, because once you had a, the 27-book canon, people copy it, they pass it down. But the books that didn't get included, uh, except for the communities that tended to retain them, you didn't necessarily have scribes copying them and saving them. And if, uh, if they aren't being copied then the original manuscripts have a bad tendency to decay and just not make it to the 20th century. Uh, one of our uh, biggest sources of knowledge about this is uh, the Nag Hammadi Library, uh, which was discovered in Egypt in 1945. Um, and it has a, a lot of, it has 52, in fact, treatises in it, mostly Gnostic. They are from the 4th century, uh, written on papyrus. They are fairly miraculously preserved. Uh, they're written in a language called Coptic. Um, and an awful lot of stuff in them was, were books that we didn't have before uh, because, again, they just sort of dwindled out of the public eye in the course of 1,600 years. Um, uh, if you haven't heard of Nag Hammadi, uh, you've probably heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered a year later in the West Bank. There are 981 texts in there. Uh, took them about 10 years to excavate them. Uh, about 40% of the books in there represent books that... Uh, we're in the Old Testament canon. There are actually no New Testament books in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're, they're Jewish documents. Um, so about 40% of them are old, you know, copies of Old Testaments with variations. That's what makes them interesting. Um, about 30% are books that were sort of deuterocanon for the Jews, uh, books that they sort of trusted but aren't in the Old, old Testament. 30% are other books. You know, it's, uh, many of them, again, we didn't have extant copies of. Um, for the Catholic Apocrypha, uh, again, I mentioned they were deuterocanonical. Uh, the Apocrypha was affirmed at the Council of Trent in 1546. Uh, it includes Tobit, Judith, First and Second Maccabees, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, and additional chapters of Esther and Daniel. I'm not going to talk about all those, um, uh, except uh, for two things. One, uh, if one of the uh, interesting things about Esther as an Old Testament book is it has the novelty of being the only Old Testament book uh, or the only, only book in the Bible, in fact, that doesn't mention God at all, like not even in passing. Not, no, not, he doesn't appear. He's not mentioned, um, which makes it interesting when you get to the Apocrypha and it has these bonus verses and bonus chapters of Esther. Chapter 10, verse 4, this is the first line in, uh, in the bonus chapters of Esther. Then uh, Mardochaeus said, God hath done these things. So four words in, and God is mentioned, uh, which kind of suggests it may be written by somebody else. Um, oh, this, by the way, I somehow advanced this. Um, to illustrate all the books in the Old Testament, because I'm not going to cover an awful lot, these are my copies of the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. I have next to it an actual copy of the Bible. Um, you can see there, there's a lot of other books um, <laughs> that uh, did not make the cut in the Old Testament. Uh, not all of them are necessarily ancient. A number of them were written in A.D. They're clearly not making the old state, the Septuagint cut three centuries B.C. when they're written in modern day. Um, I did want to take a minute to talk about uh, the other story in, uh, of Daniel in the Apocrypha uh, because it's uh, often referred to as Bell and the Dragon, B-E-L. Uh, Bell, in fact, if that name rings a... I didn't mean to say that. Rings a bell. <laughs> was trending this week uh, on social media because, sadly, uh, uh, ISIL uh, over in Syria destroyed the Temple of Bel, um, a 2,000-year-old temple, so, uh, which is uh, sad and disappointing. I did not expect when I was talking about 
a 2,000 year old uh, Syrian deity that he would show up in the news. Um, but I figured, uh, yes, exactly. Um, the story of Bell is, is uh, I, I will summarize quickly because I think this crowd will like it. Um, uh, so Daniel's in Babylon. Um, and before he gets to the part about the dragon, uh, the king <laughs> demonstrates to Daniel, it's like, we have our god Bell here. Um, he does great things for us. And Daniel tells the king, that's a statue. I mean, there, there's no actual god. That's just a clay and metal statue. Um, and the king says, no, no, it's not. We, we give him food every day. We put out a whole bunch of meat and bread and wine. Every morning we show up and the food's gone because the god has eaten it. And Daniel says, no, no, it's a statue. <laughs> and, and the king says, well, you want to make a bet on that? And Daniel says, sure. Uh, and the king says, okay, here's what we'll do. All right, we're going to lay out all the food like we always do. Then we're going to kick everybody out. We're going to lock the door. I'm going to put my seal on the door. If we come back tomorrow and the food's still here, you win, Daniel. Good job. If, on the other hand, it's all gone, off with your head. And Daniel says, do it. All right? I got faith in this because that's a, seriously, that's a statue. <laughs> so they do it. Um, and, and the king has a whole bunch of, you know, uh, you know uh, prophets, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, uh, who, who work for him. So everybody gets kicked out, um, as you might guess. Uh, what happens then, as the story tells, is uh, during the night, there's a secret door underneath the table. And the door opens up, and all these 70 prophets and their wives and kids sneak up into the room, eat everything, then sneak back out the door, shut it up, um, and then leave. Next morning, king, everybody shows up, and Daniel, and the king says, ha ha, seal still on the door, let's open up, everything's gone, Daniel, you're wrong, I was right, my statue ate everything. And Daniel says, king, look around. There's a lot of footsteps on the ground <laughs> around this statue. And the king realized, you know what, you're right. I, 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 I was not sufficiently skeptical about this notion. You're right, it's a statue. Uh, <clears throat> the king then kills everybody. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 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 so, um, but yes, so. There's, there's an Old Testament prophet teaching a skeptical lesson to the king of Babylon. Um, so, anyhow, on to the New Testament. And I have... Oh, good. I'm not doing bad. All right. Uh, oh, wait. I did have something else in the Old Testament. Um, so, ignore that slide. Yeah. Um, one is that... Uh, in, uh, I mentioned earlier, there are some other books uh, written... Uh, again, I think most of them from A.D. There's a book called like, The Life of Adam and Eve, which for the most part continues like after they get kicked out of Eden. Um, and uh, as you, you know, might guess, I suppose, uh, Satan plays a big role in The Life of Adam and Eve. Uh, like he's a recurring menace, like, like they're on a weekly television show and, you know, Satan's the, you know, one-armed man or something like that who just keeps showing up to taunt them. Um, and uh, in the life of Adam and Eve, there is the, the story told of how Satan gets kicked out of heaven, which isn't in the Bible, but the, the version that shows up uh, in the life of Adam and Eve is uh, one of the early documents, and I think this was from like the, uh, what was this, like 100, 200 AD, that helped influence the modern day notion that Satan was an angel and he gets kicked out of heaven for being disobedient. Um, yes, uh, let's see. And Michael went out and called all the angels saying, worship the image of the Lord God as the Lord God is instructed. And Michael himself worshiped first and called me, me here, this is Satan, first person Satan. Um, uh, and I answered, I do not worship Adam. And when Michael kept forcing me to worship, I said to him, Why do you compel me? I will not worship one inferior and subsequent to me. I am prior to him in creation. Before he was made, I was already made. He ought to worship me. Um, and the Lord God was angry with me and sent me with my angels out from our glory. And because of you, we were expelled into this world from our dwellings and have been cast onto the earth. And immediately we were made to grieve since we have been deprived of so great glory. Uh, yeah. So, 
If you ever wondered where the origin story of Satan came from, it uh, came from this, for the most part. Um, also, uh, I, I was amused by this in, in that big book I had, um, one of the pseudepigrapha books. Uh, it's not, it, it never would have made canon, but there's a chapter in there from an uh, Old Testament scholar. Uh, I think he was living, I forget, he was living some, sometime B.C., uh, named Demetrius, and the chapter in there is called Demetrius the Chronographer. And it's him writing, uh, we, have, we only have a few little short excerpts from him, but he's trying to figure out like the timeline of events in the Old Testament, like how the kings lined up like so almost by year, and asking questions like, when the Israelites showed up you know, after wandering the desert, where'd they get weapons from uh, to fight? Uh, basically, Demetrius, it's an Old Testament continuity nerd. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> writing in like 300 BC. Uh, so, um, on to the Gospel of Peter and New Testament. Um, okay, uh, different kinds of Gospels, because they're, you know, the, the, the four types of Gospels that made it into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, are all what we refer to as sort of narrative Gospels. They're, they're all books that actually sort of tell a story um, of, of, of Jesus' life. And not all of your books, uh, Gospels floating around in the early days were like that. If you've ever heard of the Gospel of Q, which is the name we've given uh, to a Gospel we don't have a copy of anymore. But uh, religious historians generally agree that Mark was the first gospel to come around, that Matthew and Luke were written based on Mark, uh, using it as a source, but also using this other book called, that we now call Q. And Q was just a collection of sayings. It was just quotes from Jesus. Um, and you had these other sayings books floating around. They're not telling a story. They're not... Um, they're not trying to string a narrative, you know, biography of Jesus. They're giving quotes he said as wisdom. Uh, you also had your infancy gospels, which, if I have to skip everything else, I'm talking about those because those are fantastic. Um, so, uh, to talk about a few of them, your Gospel of Peter, uh, it's pseudepigraphal, not written by Peter. Uh, it's written sometime in the second century. It was used in some churches, but eventually deemed heretical. Um, and it features... Uh, a first-hand account of the resurrection, uh, as if someone was witnessing it. Um, uh, let's see. During the night on which the Lord's day dawned, while the soldiers stood guard two by two on their watch, a great voice came from the sky. They saw the skies open, and two men descend from there. They were very bright and drew near to the tomb. The stone cast before the entrance rolled away by itself and moved to one side. The tomb was open, and both young men entered. When the soldiers saw these things, they woke up the centurion and elders, for they were also their own guard. As they were explaining what they had seen, they saw three men emerge from the tomb, two of them supporting the other, with a cross following behind them. The heads of the two reached up to the sky, but the head of the one they were leading went up above the skies. And they heard a voice from the skies, Have you preached to those who are asleep? And a reply came from the cross, Yes. So, it has a talking cross, um, <laughs> for some reason. Um, somewhat more interesting, uh, there is a book, there's, uh, uh, there was actually a, a fairly popular book a few years ago called The Gospel of Judas, uh, because this was discovered, this was a Gnostic gospel, it was originally discovered in the 70s, I don't think it got translated until the 90s, um, but it's written from the mid-2nd century, um, and uh, the historian uh, Irenaeus uh, condemned it as heretical about 180 A.D., uh, this is essentially the uh, uh, wicked version of the Gospels, um, where it's, it's the sympathetic portrayal of Judas. Uh, uh, so basically, it's, it's Jesus pulling Judas aside, telling him, uh, you know, the other guys are okay. You, however, you're great, Judas. Um, you have a very important role to play in all of this, and, and Jesus explains all this Gnostic theology to him behind the scenes. Uh, and then the book ends with Judas then betraying him. It, it leaves out the part about Jesus dying, strangely enough, but it just leads up to the, the uh, actual, you know, Judas doing exactly what Jesus tells him to, you know, tell them where I am, because all of this is important for me to get my mission forward. Um, okay. There are all kinds of other ones, too, uh, which I do not have time for. Uh, your gospel, of, like I mentioned, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, uh, Gospel of Truth, Gospel of the Nazareans, Gospel of the Ebionites, of the Egyptians, of the Hebrews, of Thomas, and so on. Anyhow. Uh, all right. So, to the extent you're familiar with the story of, uh, you know, origin stories here, you have, uh, you know, 
we're all Americans in here. We know we know how the basic origin story works. Um, where, you know, supernatural kid comes to you know, comes to Earth, uh, raised by normal people, uh, and then sort of the narrative skips ahead to when he's a grown up doing great and miraculous things. And I'm talking about Superman. Yes. <laughs> um, because this obviously this is exactly what happens in Action Comics number one, uh, where he's uh, he comes to Earth, does you know does a, you know, impresses as a kid, and then you just skip the whole narrative till he's a grown up working in Metropolis. Um, and then obviously it did not take long for writers to decide, you know, if he's that awesome as an adult, he should have been awesome as a kid, and we get Superboy. So that's what the infancy gospels are. The infancy gospels are the adventures of Jesus as a boy. Um, so you have uh, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, for instance, uh, let me see. Got a page number here? Yeah, I do got a page number. Um, yes, Gospel of Thomas. Uh, now the son of Annas the scribe was standing there with Joseph, and he took a willow branch and scattered the water that Jesus had gathered. Jesus was irritated when he saw what had happened, and he said to him, You unrighteous, irreverent idiot! What did the pools of water do to harm you? See? Now you will also be withered like a tree, and you will never bear leaves or fruit or fruit immediately. That child was completely withered. Jesus left and returned to Joseph's house, but the parents of the withered child carried him away, mourning his lost youth. They brought him to Joseph and began to accuse him. What kind of child do you have who does such things? <laughs> Somewhat later, he was going through the village, and a child ran up and banged into his shoulder. Jesus was aggravated <laughs> and said to him, you will go no further on your way. And right away, the child fell down and died. <laughs> Some of those who saw what happened said, where was this child born? For everything he says is a deed accomplished. The parents of the dead child came to Joseph and blamed him, saying, you have such a child you cannot live with us in the village or teach him to bless and not to curse, for he is killing our children. <laughs> so... Uh, to their credit, the authors of Superboy, as far as I know, never made Superboy into a serial killer. <laughs> um, so, uh, Gospel of James. The Gospel of James uh, is, is another infancy gospel. Uh, strangely enough, it does not spend an awful lot of time on the... It spends much more time on the backstory of Mary. Uh, it decides, you know who needs a origin story? Mary. So it backs up to her birth. And it talks about her parents. Um, and this was popular. This was really popular back in the day. We have 130 Greek manuscripts of this book. Um, uh, it talked, her parents are Joachim and Anna. And she was sent to the temple when she was three. And she was raised till 12 by like nuns. And she was fed by angels. Um, uh, and she was born in a wilderness cave. Uh, I'll skip that. I don't have time. Um, let's see. Uh, also, the, uh, there is the Syriac, uh, or also otherwise called the Arabic infancy gospel, 6th uh, century. Uh, part of it's from Thomas, part of it's from James. Uh, it has stories in there. Now here, you know, if, if you're familiar with the story, uh, Herod decides to kill all the kids two years younger uh, in and around Bethlehem. And Joseph and Mary get a message from God who says, go to Egypt. And they say, sure. And so they go to Egypt for like a year or two. Um, now, you might think, Jesus, being like six months old, would have trouble doing a lot of miracles. You're wrong. <laughs> because then you get stories of like uh, somebody like picking up Jesus's washed diapers and getting cured, and someone like taking his bath water and dumping it over herself and being cured. And in one case, just like it says, Mary pitied the woman and the demon went out of her. Um, there is also, did I write that down? Um, yes. Uh, it, from like the opening chapter of it. Uh, when he was lying in his cradle, he said to Mary, his mother, I am Jesus, the son of God. <laughs> the Logos, who thou hast brought forth, and as the angel Gabriel announced to thee, and my father has sent me for the salvation of the world. Strangely enough, he doesn't talk again as a baby. He just says it the, the one time. Um, uh, I was also very amused when later on it mentions uh, towards the end of all these baby miracles, uh, 
They came down to Memphis and saw Pharaoh and remained three years in Egypt. And the Lord Jesus did in Egypt many miracles. It's like it just tosses off, you know, and he met the Pharaoh. No further detail about that. Um, and, okay. Uh, it tell, it, it's too long to read the whole thing. It's another uh, a woman was living in the same place. Again, I think it says after they come back to Bethlehem. It is. Uh, whose son was tormented by Satan. He used to bite all the people who came near him. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, in the meantime, uh, was it? Uh, Jesus goes to play with his brother uh, and the demoniac uh, Judas came up and he sat down at Jesus' right hand. Then being attacked by Satan in the normal manner as usual, he wished to bite the Lord Jesus, but he was not able. Nonetheless, he struck Jesus on the side, whereupon he began to weep. And Satan came out of the boy, fleeing like a mad dog. And this boy who struck Jesus, and out of whom Satan went forth in the shape of a dog, was Judas Iscariot. Um, and now you know the rest of the story. Um, all right. Uh, there were a bunch of acts floating around in those early years. Acts of Thecla, Acts of Paul, Acts of Peter, Acts of John, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Thecla was really popular in the early church. She was a, this early female saint. She was uh, really important even through the Middle Ages. Um, she's interesting because uh, she was part of the Acts of Paul. Here, incidentally, is a 6th century fresco of her and Paul um, in uh, Ephesus in Turkey. Um, and uh, there was a, a scholar by the name of Tertullian, uh, I think in like the second century, who wrote, one, not only that the, the story of Thecla was false, uh, but uh, importantly that someone had confessed to writing it. Uh, someone over in Asia Minor, a church elder who confessed he really loved Paul. Basically, he just wanted to write more adventures of Paul, and, <laughs> and so he did. Um, but, uh, and so yeah, Tertullian is condemning this book, explaining it is fake. Don't, don't trust this book. Um, there, there, there is a great story I wanted to read that, um, where uh, uh, Thecla gets tossed into uh, an arena, and there are wild beasts that are going to attack her, um, and, uh, and a lioness comes to her defense and shoes off all the beasts, and then they put like more beasts in there, and she decides, ah, there's a pool of water. I'm going to jump in the pool of water, and, uh, and they tell her, don't do it. They're ravenous man-eating seals in that pool of water, and she does it anyway, and then lightning strikes the pool of water and electrocutes all the man-eating seals which all like float to the surface and she's okay and then she gets out of the water and then like the mists cover her nakedness so no one could see her in the nude. Um, all right, uh, you got fake, you know, you got uh, fake letters too. You got, uh, uh, there's a third Corinthians um, which uh, was accepted in some churches. It's Paul, a fake Paul, um, like, like the fake beetle Paul. Um, <laughs> rebutting Gnostic ideas. Uh, you have, um, back up, uh, Seneca was a huge Roman historian uh, back in the day, and so someone forged a bunch of letters uh, between Paul and Seneca, where basically the purpose of it is just to have Seneca saying, Paul, I like the cut of your jib. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, let's see what else do I have there. Um, uh, first and second Clement I mentioned earlier. Th these were also considered scripture by the early church. Uh, we actually we didn't have a copy of First Clement until it was very popular, but we lost it until the 17th century, uh, and then managed to rediscover it. Uh, First Clement was also uh, written about 95 A.D. It's written earlier than some of the books that made it into the New Testament. Um, it is an early, early book. Um, Paul's letter to the Laodiceans is neat because it's mentioned. In, the, in Colossians, in Paul's Colossians, he's, he tells the Colossians, I wrote a book, a letter to the Laodiceans. Um, and then uh, in one of the early canons, they say that uh, there's a letter floating around from Paul to the Laodiceans, and it's a Marcionite forgery. They forged up a letter of Paul. Um, and we have a copy. We finally discovered a copy of this. Um, and it, looks, it doesn't look like it's Gnostic. It, it doesn't look like the right book. And so uh, Ehrman's theory is that someone else came along and wrote a, another version of Paul's letter to, so it could pretend to be the real letter uh, to then take the place of the Marcionite fake letter. Um, just doubling down on the craziness. Uh, apocalypses. You have your Apocalypse of Peter. Uh, this was really popular in the early uh, church. Uh, we did not discover a copy of it until 1887 in the tomb of a Christian monk. Uh, Jesus takes Peter to visit heaven and hell uh, and, you know, plays tour guide. 
um, the Apocalypse of Paul. Uh, this one wasn't written until like the fourth century. Uh, Peter was floating around in like the second century, uh, late second century, I think. Um, uh, and, and Peter obviously didn't make the cut uh, for the gospel because it was just determined Peter didn't write it. Um, uh, so Paul visits heaven. Uh, the Apocalypse of Paul, however, was very influential in creating the, the latter day images of what the church uh, and Christianity views as heaven and hell. Um, it was also very popular. Um, the secret book of John uh, was discovered in the Nag Hammadi Library um, in 1945. It is Jesus after the resurrection talking with John. Uh, it's the Gnostic myth of creation and redemption. Um, it's from a little earlier than 180 or, or AD. AD. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of bizarre. Uh, I wish I could read more of it. But, uh, I mean, it, it's telling that Gnostic myth with uh, Yal. The creator it has the, your upper god, who then creates, like, the creator Jewish god, who it refers to as Yaltabaoth, um, and then just gets, like it's, a, like it's Scientology, like a, you know, sci-fi novel. And the archons created seven powers for themselves, and the powers created for themselves six angels, for each one until they became 365 angels, and there are the bodies belonging with the names. The first is Atoth, who has a sheep's face. The second is Eliahu, who has a donkey's face. The first is Atasphaos, who has a hyena's face, and Yao with a serpent's face, and dragon's face, and monkey's face, and uh, yeah, so on like that. Um, and that, with five minutes left, um, is, I think, the end of my talk. So, uh, so that's what I have. I left a few minutes here in case anyone wants to write, you know, ask any questions um, of a guy who has a undergraduate degree in religion. Um, it's, uh, and uh, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, I've got five minutes. Otherwise, I'll just read more stories from the infancy gospel. There's a mic behind you there if, uh, if you want to use it. It's working? Okay. Hi. Well, um, the scripture of John 14, 6 says that Jesus is the one way, the one truth, and the one life. He's the only way that we get up to heaven. And I'm just going to be really real. Um, the 66 books that are in the Bible today, as you were talking about, should be the only books that we study and look at. And it, um, Paul warns about false teaching, and we are to avoid it. Now, I just wanted to go further. And um, So Jesus is the only way. Jesus is God's Son. Um, I believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all for you, 100% God. And, and uh, to make up the Godhead of, of the supernatural trinity. Um, no one made God. God is supernatural. And there might be some people who don't believe in God, and that's fine. Um, I'm not going to force my beliefs on you, obviously. And I just wanted, my question was, how many of you guys know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? How many of you guys know Jesus? Because, you know, I, I can talk to you guys about Jesus. All right. That's fine. I, th thank you for your comment. <laughs> I am not here to proselytize, so. I did, however, have a question, uh, since you have brought up the, the, the obvious issue that we deal of in historiography of forgeries uh, and unreliable documentation. I'm a historian myself, though my period is not biblical stuff. I, I don't go back. I do some Roman stuff, but not nearly further back than that. But I was wondering what you had thought about um, some of the secular, uh, the, the two major accounts we usually bring up casually when we talk about validation of Jesus as a historical person who actually existed are the Josephus Flavius account and the Tacitus account, which doesn't say as much, but at least it does mention him existing at about that time. However, the criticism that is often brought up for the Josephus, Josephus Flavius account is that the sections that talk about Christ are written in a different tone uh, and there's something textually different about it and the accusation has been raised, though I don't think it has yet been confirmed that someone in the Catholic Church inserted those into Flavius's histories to thus retroactively validate uh, the scripture. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any, well, one specific thoughts on that, uh, or if not, uh, more you could comment on the issue and the difficulty of forgery when it comes to dealing with the historical realities versus uh, moral parables and the other things one might find in scripture. Um, well, I, I believe, um, I think Ehrman covered some of this in like his Lost Christianities. And yes, there, there is an issue that uh, shows up uh, that, uh, you know, unless you find an earlier document, it's hard to prove one way or the other, that uh, 
that as, as books got passed around over the years, that some people did have perhaps a tendency to, to add verses to them to uh, perhaps make prophecies seem more accurate than they had been, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and so th th that, that's a distinct possibility. Uh, I, I think your question might have also touched on the notion of, uh, you know, uh, Jesus as a historical figure. Uh, and I've also seen Ehrman address that uh, uh, in some talks, like I've watched on YouTube and whatnot. And, and the, the general consensus of religious and historical scholars is that he existed as a person and a historical figure. Oh, OK, OK. And therefore, he didn't actually exist. Okay. Well, I think that's a very fringe opinion that yeah, doesn't yes, have I, a lot to back historic, it up. Yes. Yeah, historically, it is, yes. So, uh, but I, I can't, I'm afraid I don't have anything else to add. So, <laughs> but th thank you for your question. Hi, um, I had a question about the early sects, and if you could go into sure. a little more detail about, say, the Marcionites and the textual tradition that we have for them. Because I know they were eradicated fairly early, you know, mm -hmm. early third century is about when they were denounced by, you know, modern, uh, modern um, <laughs> religious writers, and what we have of them, and how we know a bit more about their traditions. Since, we, uh, since they were eradicated fairly early, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, I believe we don't have a lot of original text from them. Um, so you know, how we get the history that we have. Right. Um, I, I believe, uh, and then I'm going to speak off the top of my head here, I, I believe what, what helps with the Marcionite theology is that Marcion himself was a historian and, and was writing. Um, and y you also had a number of other church leaders at the time uh, and historians who were writing about Marcion as a heretic. So to the extent that, you know, they might be accurately capturing his, you know, uh, his views and his theologies is up for debate some point, you know, to, to some extent. But uh, we do have records from those early books of people writing about him and to some extent quoting from him and saying, this is what he believes, and then in their proto-Orthodox way, this is why they don't agree with him. Um, and, and they would talk about books that he used that they didn't believe in. Um, so so to, to a large extent, what we, have, what we know about him is from people writing about him shortly thereafter, uh, it, within a century or two of his lifetime, who disagreed with him. Um, but uh, uh, so you know, you take it with a grain of salt. But you know, it, at least there, there are ancient documents that you know are, are, are discussing his views. Thanks. So just one question sure. about the biblical canon. Yes. Has it ever been commented on uh, at the time that uh, the Gospels of Mark and Luke and Paul and John, that kind of contradict themselves with regard to the resurrection and the particular parts of the resurrection? You know, there are times where, you know, we're seeing all this supernatural weird stuff happening, you know, darkness covering the earth, all this kind of stuff, and I believe it's Paul, whereas in the other books you don't necessarily see uh, all those supernatural events, and so it's just more of a normal standard resurrection in some of the other books. Yeah. So was that ever, was that ever commented on? It, it's been commented all? on a, a lot, obviously, and, and one thing you find in some of the later Gospels and, and, and later pseudepigraphal works um, is, is people actually trying to wrestle with those. Um, I, I forget which, um, uh, which later gospel it is. Uh, it might be one of the Gnostic ones, uh, where uh, the three different gospels that talk about John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, in all of them, you know, the dove comes down from heaven and whatnot, and, and God, speaking, says three slightly different things, um, which I can't quote off the top of my head, but what, the way this other Gnostic gospel addresses this is it just has God talk three times and say all three of the things in succession. Um, uh, th there's another, it's not resurrection related, but uh, I, I thought it was neat. I think it's the, I want to say it's the infancy gospel of James, which uh, deals with the issue of, like I talked about earlier, when uh, Herod is going to kill all the kids under two. Um, meanwhile, earlier in Luke, it talks about John the Baptist being like a few months older than Jesus. So a question comes up, why is John the Baptist not dead? Because he didn't flee to Egypt. Um, and so the infancy gospel of James throws a paragraph in there that I, I'd written down to, but couldn't uh, quote, uh, where it mentions that uh, John's mother, Elizabeth, fled to the mountains with uh, little baby John, and his dad, Zechariah, hung around to not tell anybody where he was born. Uh, you know, just kind of address what whoever was writing this saw as a plot hole. 
and, and to plug that as best they can. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, people as early as, you know, the, the first few centuries were aware of some of these issues and, and, and they, like I said, wrestling with them themselves. Can you recommend a, a book that kind of studies uh, what was said about those? Or? Sure. Um, like I mentioned, uh, Bart Ehrman's stuff is great. He, he, and I, he's one of the few people who writes about this material sort of before a popular audience. Um, I mean, you, you, there's any number of religious scholars who deal with it, but it, it, it's generally not seen, seen as a, uh, a subject the public is terribly interested in reading about. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, Lost Christianities, uh, for Lost Scriptures is uh, copies of the, the books themselves, these non-canon books with some little commentary on them. Uh, Lost Christianities is uh, Ehrman writing about, uh, one, some books that didn't make it in, and the, the actual arguments and discussions that went on, and some of these theologies that were competing and lost out in favor of what we now know as sort of orthodox um, belief. Uh, and he's written some other great books uh, about forgeries and uh, things like that, too. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. We have, oh, oh, we have one time for one person? Should we have just one person in line? One question if you're fast. Okay, just, I was curious about how much you thought the Council of Nicaea was influential, or did a lot, some of the stuff either get, was it getting more expanded or whittled down as far as the um, which books were being considered quote-unquote canon before they kind of made it much more official, at least for the Catholic Church, and, and maybe how much happened after. Sure. Um, answer to that uh, is that the Council of Nicaea, the, the, the records we have from that, and we do have records from the Council of Nicaea, um, they don't reflect that they actually discussed canon there. They, they discussed you know, the theology that was going to be the, the predominant theology of the church going forward, um, but they didn't, there's no record that they discussed canon. Um, there are some references in some later books uh, and, and writings that suggest that they did at least talk about it there, because I, I think there was some later theologian writing about uh, the book of Judith being brought up at the Council of Nicaea, but, um, but they didn't produce any uh, declarations or anything like that, uh, you know, to, in discussing canon. So, thanks.